road construction. See, they're letting the cars come from the other direction. Well, why are they coming on our side? If you give me Captain Marvel, I'll give you Archie. Well, they got the other side blocked. They're cutting a roadbed through here. Come on! I'm not through with it yet. What's the roadbed, Dad? I'm not even looking at it. Mom! Dad, what's a roadbed? A roadbed? Oh, it's like smoothing out the dirt so there won't be any bumps. Mom, he won't give it to me. Dad, I gotta go to the bathroom. They wait till summer to tie up the road when everybody's on the go. Boy, that takes real planning, doesn't it? Real planning. Everyone will agree, we need good roads. An efficient system of highways and interstate freeways. We drive our 100 million vehicles over a trillion miles per year. And by 1975, we will be driving close to 1 trillion 300 billion miles per year. And yet the reality of a new highway program can give rise to a chorus of interesting, if not always accurate, individual opinions. By the time they're done with the highway, it's already obsolete. We got no way of knowing if we're getting our money's worth. They drag the work out to make it last. There's no system. They build the roads wherever they feel like it. They never give one thought about marring the natural beauty of the land. And finally, there's the man who admits to the need of a new road, but says, There's not enough concern for the property owner. Build it somewhere else, not across my property. We should take a personal interest in roads, because the roads we travel on are our roads. Whether local or interstate, our roads and highways are built to meet our needs, to accommodate our patterns of living, and must continually be improved or expanded to keep pace with our population growth and mobility. Up to the coming of the automobile, highways were primarily service roads designed to link farm areas with farm markets, or to connect with railroads, which in turn would deliver the goods to the marketplace. Some historically significant roads, such as the Boston Post Road, were built to expand commerce and develop an efficient postal service. The Philadelphia and Lancaster Turnpike was the first long-distance stretch of broken stone and gravel surface built in this country according to plans and specifications. The National Pike, extending from Maryland to Indiana, spanned 677 miles and accounted for a major share of the east-west traffic up until the early 1850s. The famous Oregon Trail inspired a giant step westward. The trail began at Independence, Missouri and crossed 2,000 miles of mountains and plains to the Pacific shores. For the next 50 years or more, the vast majority of our highway miles would come under the heading of local service roads. Not until the automobile was taken seriously did the concept of local service roads expand into a network of highways. As the disconnected sections of roads were joined in continuous long distance routes, travelers were bewildered by the confusing array of highway numbers. In 1925, the American Association of State Highway Officials came to the rescue. They suggested a plan of marking the main roads of the country with standardized information and direction signs. According to this system, even numbers are used for east-west interstate roads, and odd numbers are used for north-south routes. The U.S. designation does not mean the federal government has financed the road. It is simply a route marking system set up by the states to guide travelers. Although the federal government has been involved with road financing to varying degrees since 1916, large-scale financial support did not come about until the mid-1950s, when a mounting tide of traffic dictated the need for our present 42,500-mile interstate highway program, a coast-to-coast -coast network of freeways that will link together more than 90% of our cities with populations of 50,000 or more, 
as well as countless smaller towns and communities along the routes. When completed, the interstate system will directly serve half of the urban and rural population of the country, with the federal government bearing 90% of the burden. The entire cost of the federal aid highway program is paid for by the highway users themselves in the form of specific tax revenues placed in the Federal Highway Trust Fund. None of the funds come from income or property taxes. The states also finance their portion of the program with road user taxes, which include vehicle license fees. Trucks alone pay about one-third of all state highway use taxes. The trucking industry has been rightfully called the lifeline of America. Manufacturers across the nation rely on highway transport for the raw materials and supplies essential to their operation. And almost everything we eat or use or wear is brought to us in trucks. Yet all the trucks combined make up only one-fifth of the vehicles on the road today. It is the responsibility of each state to plan and develop highway programs. More specifically, it's the responsibility of the state's highway department, a big organization engaged in big projects. In some areas, the biggest projects in the state. The highway department is essentially an engineering operation responsible for selecting and planning the location, designing the highway, acquiring the right of way, supervising construction, and finally, inspection and maintenance. An experienced highway department man will tell you, you don't have to dream up highway projects. There's always more need than funds available. So we use a special rating system to decide what project should take priority over others. In a single year, we go over every mile of highway in the state. And we study maintenance reports and the condition of the road. We check accident frequency. We measure and project into the future traffic flow by means of origin and destination surveys in which the motorist himself provides us with such information as frequency of use, purpose of travel, and selection of a particular route. Another way we determine traffic patterns is by means of portable pneumatic traffic counters. Permanent installations tell us when a road is nearing its maximum traffic capacity. Sensors buried in the pavement are activated when a passing vehicle disturbs an electronic field. Hourly volume reports are recorded and stored by the counters until called upon by the division planning office to report in. Punch tapes are inserted in a teletype system which automatically contacts all the permanent counters throughout the state. The data from any point is then received in the planning office in a matter of seconds. Automatic readers are used to record the tapes received from the portable counters in the field. Information gathered from all the different studies is fed into a computer system. Here it is stored, sorted, analyzed, and finally organized into what we call a sufficiency rating book. We study all the areas that indicate a need for a new or expanded road. We project these needs 20 years into the future and only then recommend job priorities. Let's say we discover a pressing need to complete a new section of interstate highway. The first step in planning the actual route calls for aerial reconnaissance of the area using special photographic equipment. The camera plane flies along the corridor or area through which the road will pass while a camera takes overlapping pictures of every square foot of terrain below. Of course, there's a big difference between our method called photogrammetry and conventional photography. The plates produced by our aerial cameras are mounted in a plotting machine. The optical system of the plotter produces a three-dimensional picture nine times the original size of the slides. As the operator maneuvers a floating point over the picture he sees, the mechanical arm traces an accurate topographical map on paper. A negative of the map is then made by other technicians using scribe coat film, which in turn is used as a master for reproducing blueprints. In locating the route, 
we want to allow for the greatest traffic flow from point A to point B to keep costs down. At the same time, we must do everything we can to avoid disrupting established residential neighborhoods and business districts and parks and recreational areas, and scenic or historic sites. Usually, several alternate routes are planned, each with advantages and disadvantages. One may serve through traffic very well, but involve high construction costs. Another may indicate low costs, but provide poor service for local traffic. After the pros and cons have been weighed and a route selected, probable costs must be estimated. A major consideration in estimating construction costs is the ground itself. Drilling crews take core samples from various depths all along the route to help us determine the subsurface structure of the soil. A hollow core section is lowered through the pipe and driven into the undisturbed soil at the bottom of the shaft. The location and depth of each test is carefully recorded for future reference. After the core section is removed from the hole and opened, the samples are labeled and sent to the laboratory for analysis. Here, a myriad of tests are performed to determine the physical characteristics of each sample. In this case, the laboratory technician is preparing a clay core for a shear resistance test. The center ring of the apparatus is separate from the ends and is supported only by the column of clay when the lock screws are removed. If a specific weight is added to the ring, the amount of settlement indicated by the gauge can be plotted against the time and load factors to find the ultimate shear resistance value of the soil. A subsurface profile of soil strength worked up from a series of test reports helps us greatly in estimating overall construction costs. Finally, with all the facts and figures gathered, the highway project is ready to be presented at a public hearing. Federal regulation requires that two public hearings be held to inform residents of the project and to hear their views. Highway department representatives are on hand to explain the details and answer any questions from the floor. Transcripts are made so that both state and federal officials can review all the information gathered at the meetings. Particular attention is paid to citizen reaction and adjustments are made wherever possible to eliminate points of friction. City and county officials, as well as school boards and administrators of recreational facilities, are also consulted. Once the route has been finalized, the plans must be approved by the Federal Bureau of Public Roads before they are given to the right-of-way division, the department responsible for acquiring the land needed for the new highway. It's their job to itemize the property and land parcels that will have to be bought by the state and with the help of experienced independent appraisers, determine the fair market value of the property. That is an estimate of the highest price the property would bring if put up for sale on the open market. Facts and figures are double checked by the highway department's appraisal section before being turned over to the acquisition section. Now the owner is contacted and the state makes its formal offer to purchase his home or property. The highway program is explained in detail. Also, the principles of eminent domain, the right of the state to acquire private property for public use with a payment of fair compensation to the owner. At the same time, the property owner is offered thorough assistance in relocating and is given a moving expense allowance based on the number of rooms in the house or actual moving costs. From this point on, all work will be handled by private companies. Request of bid notices are published in local newspapers and trade magazines, and bid proposals are made available upon request to qualified contractors. The proposal includes detailed specifications and calls for a unit cost breakdown of all materials that will be used. A contractor just doesn't quote on the total price for the job. He has to account for every penny and show how it will be spent. Any contractor who is interested in bidding on a multi-million dollar highway project will have a large, successful operation built on years of experience. 
The chief estimator divides the proposal into component job classifications and assigns a member of his staff, each an expert in his field, to estimate costs for that portion of the job. They devote full time to analyzing job proposals and estimating costs. The lowest bid wins the job, and they know they'll be competing with equally successful and experienced organizations. The plan, designed by the State Highway Department, is laid out in phases and studied in detail, including on-the-spot investigations by the contractor's engineers. Daily records of actual job costs are tabulated and applied to the future project. Suppliers and subcontractors are called in order to get their very latest cost figures. The figures are checked and rechecked. Any errors here could mean a loss of the job, or worse yet, a loss on the job. All bids must be submitted by a specified time set by the State Highway Department for the public bid opening. The sealed envelopes are registered as they arrive and remain sealed until after the closing hour. Then all bids are opened in public. The proposal and its accompanying good faith deposit are perforated to validate them. Next, the bids are read aloud and the contract is awarded to the lowest bidder. The project is now in the hands of the independent contractor. The State Highway Department assigns engineers to survey and inspect the work as it's completed and to conduct tests, such as these hydraulic and nuclear compaction tests, to be sure the requirements and specifications of the contract are being met. No contractor has to be reminded about responsibility. A job this size is too big to allow for miscalculations or poor work scheduling. Figure wrong, and you might be out a few million dollars before your mistakes are corrected. You estimate the job to the penny, and then you put your faith in the best men, machines, methods, and materials you can find. The contractor relies on his engineers, technicians, and equipment operators. They're experts, and all of them feel a personal responsibility for their share of the job. A contractor relies on his suppliers to set up their schedules in a way that will assure a steady flow of materials to the job site as the work progresses. He relies on advanced technology and the latest, most efficient methods of doing the job. But most of all, he relies on his men, whose skill and training and ruggedness make it possible to get the job done. A contractor relies on subcontractors when they're needed. The outfit that specializes in building bridges, for example. It takes real skill and experience for a crew to set over 32,000 pounds of concrete span on a pair of one-inch pins from a floating base some 80 feet below.
the contractor may have to call on the tunnel experts who can bore through a mountain of solid rock and save you a hundred miles of difficult driving. Here, just outside Denver, Colorado, two 80-foot tubes, almost two miles long, will soon penetrate the Continental Divide, 3,000 feet below the summit. And finally, the contractor relies on the landscapers, who specialize in restoring the natural beauty of the area, where it might have been disturbed. The 42,500-mile interstate system is scheduled for completion in 1975. In the meantime, research and development programs are underway in a wide range of fields related to highway safety. The Bureau of Public Roads, for example, has its own research staff and facilities and cooperates closely with state highway department projects. The Bureau's huge wind tunnel is used to test innovations in highway bridge building. The winds produced by the fans cause the model to react just as the real bridge would if subjected to the same stresses. Gale winds equivalent to 300 miles per hour can be generated in the tunnel to find any weaknesses in the structural design. Private industry, serving the highway transportation field, is heavily engaged in research, beneficial to the highway user. A bridge rail guard, developed at the General Motors Proving Grounds, not only minimizes the effect of collision on the occupants, but also lessens the damage to the vehicle itself. Breakaway aluminum poles have been developed. Although built to withstand the rigors of wind and weather, the base gives way to the shearing action of a collision. Over 2,000 accidents involving aluminum poles have been reported without a single fatality. Mesh screens between traffic lanes in areas where the median is limited are being installed to eliminate headlight glare from oncoming cars, thereby reducing accidents. Electronic surveillance systems are being tested to ease congestion and speed the flow of traffic during peak periods. The operator can control lane speeds for miles of expressway from one central location. Computers located in the control office are fed continuous traffic counts by automatic counters along the route. These figures are instantly compared with the safety capacity of the roadway. The computer restricts the flow of incoming traffic by regulating signals on the entrance ramps to eliminate jams and pileups. Motorist aid phone systems are being installed between the exits on the interstate freeways. Telephones are spaced from a quarter to a half mile apart. Stranded drivers are able to summon police or service aid in a matter of minutes. But the interstate system itself is the most important safety factor. It is estimated that the existence of freeways will reduce the annual traffic death toll by 8,000, a reduction of 16%. From an economic standpoint, the freeway system offers a variety of advantages. Freeways are feeding new life into downtown areas, giving impetus to city planning, and becoming integrated more and more with urban renewal programs. As the profiles of our cities change, commercial property along the freeway invariably increases in value. Along Los Angeles freeways, values have increased seven to eight hundred percent. In Atlanta, property values have increased more than 400%. Other large cities, Chicago, Dallas, Baltimore, Boston, Minneapolis, Miami, all report similar increases. In rural areas, surveys show that the bypassing of a small town does not hurt local business, but actually increases it. The freeway provides more prospective customers all within easy access to the stores, shops,